Good, good. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I come before you. We come before you, confessing to you that we are sinners saved by your grace. We ask you to forgive us for our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might understand your word and take it to heart and live by it. Father, we do want to claim the promise that faith comes through the hearing of your word, and Lord, you know we all need more faith. So Lord, please bless us with that faith. <clears throat> Help us to understand your word. Help us to understand it accurately and see the types that you want us to see in it. Lord, we do hold up our church to you and ask that you'll continue to bless it. We thank you for it. We pray that you'll bless every aspect of it that you might be blessed. Help us to be a light in this community, Father. We also want to pray, Lord God, for our president, for our country. We ask that you'll bless him, protect him and his family, uh, convict him and his staff to do what's right. Father, we know that you have the plan for this election, which will be uh, fitting into the puzzle of prophecy. So Lord, <clears throat> help us to accept whatever decision you make. We just ask that Lord God, you'd bring um, peace to our country, peace to uh, Israel. Father, we pray for your Jewish people that you would please um, witness to them and cause them the blindness to be lifted and for them to see that Jesus Christ is the Savior. We pray, Lord God, for the Christian people around the world that you would please help your people with their health, their marriages, or if they're single, their jobs and businesses, their families, their ministries. Help those who are suffering, poor, discouraged, depressed, living in countries where they cannot worship you openly, living in through some type of a disaster, including this COVID virus. Father, we do want to also pray that, Lord God, you'd bless our servicemen and women, keep them safe, bring them home safely, Lord, and give them Christian fellowship wherever they're stationed. Father, please bless every single one of us that are here today and those that are going to be watching or listening on uh, the CDs, that you'd bless this study, Lord. Help us to understand it, and we'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, does anybody know where we're at? Chapter 25. And, uh -huh. So, okay. Well, let's go ahead and just do a quick review. So... <clears throat> in chapter 20 of Exodus, God gives the people through Moses the Ten Commandments. Then in chapter 21, he gives them additional laws, uh, laws for personal injuries, if somebody kills somebody, if somebody hurts somebody. In chapter 22, he gives uh, laws concerning protection of property, theft, and and trespass, damage by fire. If you leave your property with someone and, and something happens to it, also he gave in uh, chapters 22, verses 14 to 15, about loans. And then in the last part of chapter 22, he talks about social responsibility, uh, widows, virgins, etc. In chapter 23, he talks, talks about laws of justice and mercy and about spreading false reports, about gossip and slander, false witnesses, following the crowd when they do wrong. Boy, and we're really seeing that today for sure, you know. Um, I, I hope we have some policemen left that are willing to, to work in this uh, environment that has been created in so many different cities. Yeah, yeah, the chief of, chiefs of police have quit in several different major country, uh, uh, 
states. Yeah. Then in chapter 23, verse 10, we've got the Sabbath laws that they were to set one day a week aside to rest and to think about God and to, to worship Him and to just uh, meditate on the laws, give the animals a break, the peoples a break, a ser the servants a break. And he said that every seven years, they were to give the land a break. They were not to uh, plant or harvest that year, but just let it grow wild. And that way the ground would uh, replenish the mir uh, minerals in it. And the poor people could come along and they could glean some of the uh, crops that grew for their own food. And that was a good thing. Then in... Chapter 23, he talks about the three annual festivals, the unleavened bread, the feast of harvest, first fruits, and the feast of ingathering, and they were to celebrate these three feasts. I'm going to work up a study for us on the feasts of the Lord, because each one of these feasts has, is a type for something in the New Testament. And I can, I'm going to, I'm going to um, whet your appetite for, for the study in this, is that for surety, Jesus Christ will come back on one of those feasts, probably the Feast of Trumpets, okay? So the feasts are very important, and the feasts speak of something that is it is more than just what we see in the Old Testament. But I don't have that study worked up yet, but I promise you I will work it up, okay? And it's really, really interesting. Yes? Abib? Well, that was the first... Okay, that... When, when the Jews came out of Israel, that month that they came out became the first month of their calendar. And I don't remember what month that is in our calendar. I just, I just don't. Is that not correct? Oh. Well, I know that, I know that they did change their calendar when they came out of Egypt. I don't remember then what month that first month is. So we'll find that out. Maybe Digger, you could. Right, Bill? The Passover month? Yeah. Okay. Exodus 12, 2. Let's look at that real quick. Since we're, since we're uh, on that. Exodus 12, 2. Yeah. 12, 1 says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of the year. So this was the Passover. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, blah, 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 each man is to take a... Let me see. That's Nisan. Nis what? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so I think that, yes, the Jewish calendar now then would begin with March and not with September. It used to begin with September. Nisan, I believe, is the, the first month that they came out of Egypt. And then, um, so that would be spring. It could be, I, I don't know if it's April or not, uh, Lee, but it's, I've got March in my Bible, but it could be, it could be April. Okay, so chap, so I'm glad we, thank you, Digger, thank you for correcting me. Um, oh, he, I never get derailed, I'm, I, I'm never on the rails, so it's hard to get derailed. Then, um, so the three annual festivals were, were mandatory that the Jews kept those festivals, and we will study those shortly. Then, uh, in the last part of chapter 23, God says that he's sending the angel uh, ahead of them into this land, and he's going to uh, 
defeat the enemies, the people that are living in the land, not all at once, but when they need it, when they need them to be defeated because he was concerned that if the, uh, God was concerned that if, if all the enemies were defeated, the land would become desolate. Okay, at least they kept the land up. He says in chapter 23, verse 29, he says, But I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. Then he gives them borders in uh, chapter 23, verse 31. I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the desert to the river. I will hand over to you the people who live in the land and you will drive them out before you. And he specifically says in verse 32, do not make a covenant with them or with their gods. Do not let them live in your land or they will cause you to sin against me because the worship of their gods will certainly be a snare to you. And it turned out that that's exactly what happened. Okay. Then in chapter 24, let's do a quick review there. Then he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. Now, Nadab and Abihu were sons of Aaron. And, the se and 70 of the elders of Israel. You're to worship at a distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near, and the people may not come with him. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, Everything the Lord has said we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. Now, he got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountains and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men. Now, remember that the priesthood had not been established yet. So these young men may have been the young men that were dedicated to the Lord by their parents when God said, give me the first fruits of your sons, etc. Um, he sent the young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half the blood and put it in bowls and the other half he sprinkled on the altar. Now, one thing I want all of us to do as we read this is we want to search for types that speak to us of something that's happening in the New Testament, something that's happening with Jesus. And we're talking, of course, about blood here and the blood that was sprinkled on the altar. So, so the priest sprinkled blood on the altar, right? What to, to you would that represent in a New Testament setting? So the altar was set before God. The altar was not in the Holy of Holies. Let me describe the tabernacle to you, okay? So the tabernacle was a tent, and there was a two big, you call them curtains, but they were actually tents. There was a tent covering the tent, and the tent that was covering the tent was, was to keep bad weather and foul weather out. Uh, of the of the of the uh, the courtyard. Now, when so you've got this tent. It's roughly let's see this this was um, so the ten, the the courtyard the whole tabernacle. When we say tabernacle, you can you can substitute tent for it. You can substitute sanctuary for it. That's, that's, that's the place that God set up to meet with the people, to live with the people. It was 50 yards long, so that's 150 feet. That's half, half a football field. And it was 25 yards wide. So it was 
a, a pretty good sized place. And in there, toward the back, was what they called the Holy of Holies. Inside the Holy of Holies, we're going to see that God instructs Moses to build this chest. They call it the Ark, Ark of the Covenant. And in this chest, and, it, and we'll get into the dimensions of it and everything else in just a few minutes, in this chest was the manna, okay, the jar of manna, and that was to tell the people or remind the people that God always provided for them in the wilderness. It was Aaron's rod that budded, and it was the, the tablets of stone that the commandments were written on, okay? That was what was in the ark. Now, that was the... I believe that that was the only thing in the Holy of Holies. Outside of that little room, okay, was called... So that was called the Most Holy Place, or the Holy of Holies. Then outside that room was called the Holy Place. Only the high priest could go into the Most Holy Place, and that only once a year he went in. Now, the Most... Or the Holy Place is where the... The priests did the offerings. There was the table there. There was the, the laver, the altar, where the sacrifices were put on. And there was other accoutrements that we will discuss here in just a few minutes. So when the, the sacrifice was put on the altar and it was killed, then the blood was collected and it was sprinkled. All right, it was sprinkled. So the blood, of course, represented the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses all of us from sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, the Bible says. So now we see here in chapter 24, verse uh, 4, Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. So this is, this is still before the furniture of the tabernacle and everything is put together. That's coming up. It says, Then he sent young Israelite men and they burnt, offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. So fellowship offerings would tell you what? That this ritual was a part of, of being able to have fellowship with God. All right? Now, it says, Moses took half the blood and put it in bowls, and the other half he sprinkled on the altar. So half of it he put in bowls, and the other half he sprinkled on the altar. So as I look at this, you know, the Bible says in Hebrews, and we'll read this today, that these things we're reading about are pictures of something in the heavenlies. Okay? The temple that was built, all right? We haven't got to the temple yet. The temple that was built was built... Exactly like the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, the altar, the table, the bread, etc., the offerings and everything. So this is a copy, this will be a copy of something that's in heaven. And hopefully we can figure that out. Now, it says here in chapter uh, 24, verse 7, then he took the blood of the, co the book of the covenant and read it to the people. The book of the covenant is the laws that God gave. Remember something, that God is covenanting, he's making an agreement with this Jewish peoples, this nation. This is going to become a theocracy, which means God is the king and the people are his subjects. Now, this is the reason why when the Jews demanded that God give them a king, God was upset because God was supposed to be their king. It was supposed to be a theocracy, not a democracy, 
but a theocracy. So these were supposed to be their people, God's nation. If they obeyed his commands and the laws that he set up for them, he would bless them and they would fellowship with him and, and, and be his people. He would be their God. And, and they, they would be the... Um, uh, protectors of God's word as well as they would be the disseminators of God's word to the other nations, right? So this was a very special thing that God was covenanting with them. This was a covenant. It's called the Old Covenant in the, um, in the, in the New Testament. You know, we call this the Old Testament and the New Testament. But in reality, it's the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. All right? Now, so then we go on to chapter 24, verse 8. So I look at this altar kind of as Christ being offered, offering his blood to God as atonement for the sins of the world, right? In, in a sense. Because that's what the priest was typifying. Now... When he sprinkled the blood on the people, and I think that this is the only time, if I'm right, that the Bible says that blood was sprinkled on the people. Um, when Moses took and sprinkled the blood on people, in, in verse 8, it says, Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So the priest placed the blood on the altar, which to me was Christ, pictured Christ placing his death, his blood before God, saying this is atonement for the sins of the people. And then the priest sprinkling it on the people says to me anyway that the blood now covers the people. Okay, the, the people that... That, believed, that believe in the Lord. Now, it says in verse 9, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Now, they didn't actually see God. No one's seen God. They saw some manifestation of God, though. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. That's interesting because when we Read in Revelation, we, we, remember we studied Revelation, we talked about the crystal sea as clear as glass. Maybe this has something, uh, maybe this is a type of that. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and drank. So they're fellowshipping with God. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commands I have written in for their instruction. Now let me read Mark 9.2. I'm not, I got that marked, I've got that down in my Bible and I'm not sure why, but let me just read it. Let me see what it says. Mark 9.2. Yeah, this is when Jesus went up to the mountain and he transfigured and it says here, that after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up to a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. So this to me then uh, may be a type for that. Now... In verse 12, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commands I have written for their instruction. Then Moses set out with Joshua, his aide, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you, and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. So he left Aaron and her in charge here. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. 
For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went on up the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, I think somewhere in here, and I haven't run across it yet in Exodus, I believe that Moses fasted for those 40 days and 40 nights. Let me read some things to you, and you're welcome to turn to them. Uh, let's just let's just look at the book of Hebrews, and uh, because Hebrews, man, it is it goes along with this so well, and I just want to I just want to read bits and pieces of the book of Hebrews, so that when we go back to Exodus, it'll make a little more sense in trying to figure out what the type is in the Old Testament. That's referring to the New Testament, okay? So in, Mo, in uh, let's see, let's start in uh, Hebrews chapter 3. And you're welcome to turn there. I'm just going to read parts of different chapters. It says this. Now, the, the book of Hebrews, we don't know who the author was. I mean, nobody really has come up with a definite answer. But... It was written to Hebrews, and it was written to people that were affiliated or were um, associated in some way with the Mosaic Law. So uh, the problem that the book of Hebrews deals with is that he was showing... Okay, the author of the book of Hebrews was showing the new covenant as compared to the old covenant because some of these Christians or Jews who were considering the Christian faith were trying to incorporate parts of the law with Christianity. And the author here says, uh-uh, that don't work. You can't mix the two. It's one or the other, and the old is already gone and the new is here. So in chapter 3, in verse 1, he says, Therefore, holy brothers, so he's obviously talking to brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son. So Moses was faithful as a servant, Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house. We hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. Now, then go with me to chapter 4 and go to verse 14. Okay, chapter 4, verse 14. It says here, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet with, was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So this author says that we are to approach God's throne of grace with confidence. If you compare that to what the Israelites did in Exodus, right? Okay. How did they approach the mountain? With fear and trembling, huh? Yeah. Now... We're going to speak to that in just a second. Look at 
chapter 5, verse 1. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God. And we're, we're going to be seeing that as now we, we're going to be studying the priests, his garments, the furniture, the tabernacle, uh, the ark, etc. It says here, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He, this high priest, this human high priest, is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. Why? Since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son. Today I've become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever during the order of Melchizedek. Now, so then in chapter, I'm gonna, I wasn't going to read this, but I'm going to read chapter 6, part of chapter 6 to you. It says, therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ. If you go back up to chapter 5 in verse um, 11, it says, we have much to say about this, about Jesus and his priesthood, about his sufferings, about etc., etc. But it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact... Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. Why? Well, because they were mixing dispensations. They were mixing the law, or trying to mix the law, with grace. We're going to see that in just a second. He says, you need milk, not solid food. And Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use, this is interesting, solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Okay? Okay. So now he goes on in chapter 6. He says, therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance that acts from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting we will do so. Though this is a very misunderstood verse uh, that is coming up in, ver in verse 4. It says, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened. Okay, so those who have once at once heard the gospel, who have tasted the heavenly gift, the Holy Spirit has led them to the gospel, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has revealed the gospel, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming away. If they fall away, and they're falling away in, back into the law, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance. Why? Because to their loss, they're crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. What did the priest do? The priest went and he offered sacrifices for his sins. Then he offered sacrifices for the people's sins. And they did that all the time. Okay, They, they, they had offerings, certain offerings, certain offerings for certain things. Jesus offered himself how many times? Once for all, right? Once for all. So if these people go back to the law and go back to the offerings, what they're doing is, in effect, they're just saying, 
that the death of Jesus Christ once for all was not good enough. Okay? We got to keep repeating this sacrifice all over again, all over again. And if they go back into the law, then, then what they do, have done is they've in effect annulled the death of Christ to themselves and are depending on something that isn't going to save them. And that's why it's impossible for them to be brought back to repentance under the law because we're not under the law anymore. All right. Now, let's go to chapter 8. Okay. Chapter 8, verse 1. It says, the point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. The tabernacle that we're studying in Exodus was not the true tabernacle. It was just a copy and it was set up by man. God instructed Moses how to set it up. Well, it says here that Jesus Christ has sat down at the right hand of the Father and he is serving in the true tabernacle, which is not a copy. He says in verse 3, every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. Speaking of Jesus, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are all are already men who offer gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary, that is the tabernacle, that is the tent, that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This tabernacle that we're, that we're studying about, that God is going to have Moses set up, is a copy of the sanctuary that's in heaven. And I don't know whether we'll ever be able to completely understand that, but we're going to try. It says here, this is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. And we're right there in chapter 24, 25, 26, when Moses is going to build that tabernacle. It says, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. What did we just read in Exodus? Moses went up to the mountain, right? He spent 40 days and 40 nights up there. God is giving him the dimensions. He's giving him the accoutrements that he wants Moses to build. He's giving him everything that concerns this sanctuary, this earthly sanctuary. He says this, verse 6, But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one and is founded on better promises. In verse 7 he says, For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant. What's the first covenant? We just studied it. God covenanted with the Jewish people to make them a theocracy, a nation under God. That was the covenant, right? He gave them the laws, the, the, all of the laws, the Ten Commandments, the social commandments, the personal commandments, the property commandments, all that stuff. He says this, For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. Now this covenant will be fulfilled during the millennium with the nation of Israel. Okay? This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. Where were they written before? 
tablets of stone. Yeah. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. All right? Now, chapter 9 is an amazing chapter. We read part of it last week, so let's just read it again because it goes right along with what we're studying. Now, the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. That's the tent. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant. The ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory. We're going to see that as we read God's instructions for making the ark, okay? Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory. They were on the cover, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these details now. We'll discuss them shortly. When everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room. The outer room was called what? The holy place. To carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, that's the most holy place, or the holy of holies, and that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. Now listen to verse 9. This, okay, this, this whole Old Testament stuff that we're studying, right? is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered then were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. When Christ, verse 11, came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He went through the heavens, okay, into heaven. It says here, he did not enter this, this heavenly sanctuary now, not the earthly sanctuary, he did not enter by means of the blood of bull of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place, that's the one in heaven, once for all by his own blood. Having obtained eternal redemption. Verse 13. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. He says, how much more then, verse 14, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he, Jesus, has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first 
covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it because a will is, on, is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. A living will is a kind of a new thing. It says here, this is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll, scroll and all the people. He said, Moses said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. He says, in fact, verse 22, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then, I love this verse, it was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things. What were the copies of the heavenly things? The items in the tabernacle. The tabernacle itself, the most holy place, the holy place, all the items, all the furniture, all the bowls, all the labors, Everything had a meaning. Everything was a picture of something that's in heaven. It says here, It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again. The way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. Now, doesn't that just go along with what we read in chapter 6? That if you keep crucifying the Son of God afresh, there is no room for repentance. It says, then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away of the sins of many people and he will appear a second time not to bear sin but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him now do you find this interesting i mean to me correlating this with the old testament with what what we're studying it's going to help us to understand what we're studying in the old testament chapter 10 in verse 1 it says the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. So when we are walking on a sunny day and we see the shadow, the shadow is not us. It's just a copy of us. We are the reality. The shadow is not the reality. And that's what he's saying here is that the accoutrements that we're reading about and studying about in the Old Testament in Exodus are the shadow of what's the reality in heaven. It says here, for this reason, it, that would be the law, okay, can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, if the law could, would they not have stopped being offered? If the sacrifices could have cleansed, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshiper, worshiper, worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices 
are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, this is a quote from Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First he said, verse 8, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you plead, pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first, that's the first covenant, the law, to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. <coughs> Excuse me. Day after day, pre every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, that would be Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifices for one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time. He, Jesus, waits for his enemies to be made his footstool because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds their sins and lawless acts. I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence, boy, this is amazing. You know, think about, you know, the people of Moses' day, they were scared to death. They didn't even want... God to talk to them. They said, Moses, have God talk to you and then you talk to us. Okay? It says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place. Are you getting that? The most holy place. By the blood of Jesus, we have confidence. Listen, that's you and me to enter the most holy place. By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. When Jesus Christ died in Matthew, it tells us that the curtain, the huge curtain that separated was torn in two. And that was a um, recognition that, uh, that God made that... We now have access to the most holy place by the blood of Jesus Christ, whereas the high priest alone was only able to enter that once a year and, and he had to have blood with him. Is that amazing? We get to enter the most holy place. It says this, Therefore, brothers, verse 19, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain. That is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good, need, good deeds. And he goes on and on. Now, go to with me to, let's see. Um, uh, chapter 12. OK. 
okay, chapter, chapter 12, 12, Hebrews, verse 1. one. Yes. yes. So there is, okay, yeah, I don't know whether that's a myth or a truth. What they said is when the high priest, you know, the high priest had, had bells, little bells on the bottom of his robe. They looked, they were made in the shape of pomegranates. And when he went into the most holy place, it, it is said that there was a rope tied to his leg so that if he had sin on him and died in there and didn't come out, they could pull him out. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not. I, I, it, it's, it's, it's definitely been spoken about over the centuries. So, uh, if somebody has a has a uh, interest in looking that up, that'd be awesome. Chapter twelve, verse one. It says, "Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders." And the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the, the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him or study him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now go to, let's see, chapter 12. Yeah, okay, so let's see here. Where do I want to go to chapter 12, verse 14? It says, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and then no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inherited rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. Now listen to this next uh, several, uh, several verses. verses. You, you have, have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word could be, would be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. Even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But, verse 22, you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Let's see what it says here. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on the earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, it's not an earthly kingdom, it's a heavenly kingdom, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Referring back to the mountain. So go back with me to... Uh, Chapter 24, Exodus, 
Okay. Verse 12, 24, 12. The Lord said to Moses, come to me on the mountain, stay here. And I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commands I have written for their instruction. Then Moses sent out, set out with Joshua, his aide, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Ur, Hur are with you, and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. Boy, I tell you, what a sight that must have been. For six days, the cloud covered the mountain. Now think about this. Joshua and Moses are up there in that cloud. And on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the clouds. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went on up the mountain. So Joshua stayed down below, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. How long was Jesus in the desert? Huh? 40, 40 days and 40 nights. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, Jesus was... Jesus, yeah, Jesus was, when he was tempted by the devil, Matthew chapter 4, he was in the, the desert 40 days and 40 nights. And, uh, and at the end of that time, he was tested. Well, my friends, uh, I, I don't know about you, but I love that book of Hebrews. That, that really does help us to kind of differentiate the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the Old Testament and the New Testament, Everything in the Old Covenant was a picture of something in the New Covenant. And what my job is to do is to try to show you what those things mean. And that's So I will accept any um, help that anybody wants to offer because some of this is a little bit hard to try to understand. But we'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll get through it and we'll, we'll understand it. I'm going to let you guys out 10 minutes early because I'm pooped. And uh, so, huh? I have a question. You have a question? Okay. Yeah. Let me answer that after we, let me answer that after we pray, okay? Yeah. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that we're under the new covenant that Jesus is our high priest, that we can enter that, we can enter that most holy place and come before the, the throne of grace with confidence, knowing that because of Jesus Christ, you have accepted us. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your courage, obedience, faithfulness, your precious life and death, resurrection, ascension and intercession. Father, we pray that You'll help us to understand this even better and help us to appreciate you even more. We'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys.